on chapter uh, 14. Uh, we've been in chapter 14 uh, now for quite some time, and I think we have gone throughout the whole, you know, the whole uh, uh, chapter pretty good. We've walked through all the different lessons, but today we're going to deal with uh, those last couple of verses, and uh, it's going to behoove us to really kind of pay attention on what God is saying here, especially when it relates to this harvesting of the earth. So we got some things that we need to cover, and we want to make sure that we're able to give it its just due. Uh, the Bible is so rich. The Bible is so rich, and it is important that we do not make up our Christianity based upon our own view, our own perspective. Uh, let's not presume upon uh, God on what he wants or what he doesn't want. Let the Bible speak to us. That's why he's given us his word, so we can know exactly what God is saying. Remember, the Bible is divinely inspired by God. And what do we mean by that? God inspired the writers of it. That doesn't mean he came down and wrote it itself. No, he inspired men to write it. They were led by the Holy Spirit, you see. And so we have the Word of God. We have what's known as the special revelation of God. Yeah, we have general revelation, which is creation. But that doesn't tell us the character of God. That doesn't tell us who God is. But the special revelation of God, which is the Word of God, not prophetic. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the Word of God, the completed Scripture. That's what we're talking about, and that's why we love to walk through it and let the Bible speak to us. As Christians, we have got to be rooted and grounded in the Scriptures. We have to. So important that that takes place with us, man. The Scriptures have to be the most important thing in your life because that is, that is what connects you to Jesus. Somebody says, no prayer. Well, if you're not praying the Scriptures, then I don't know what you're doing. You see, you're just praying your own imagination and slinging mud up against the wall. But when you know you're praying according to the Word of God, you know God hears. You know He answers. Amen. My sheep hear my voice, and the All voice right. of a stranger He will not follow. Will not follow. But that's not trying to decipher what the voice of God is in your head. Right. Yeah. If you're going to try to figure that out, I'm telling you, man, you're going to be in a crazy house. You, you're not going to be able to figure out how God sounds. Because I promise you, it'll sound like you. Right. <laughs> so that's not what we're talking about. Right. And Jesus is not saying my sheep know my voice because they can decipher my tone and pitch. No, he's talking about they know his voice because they know the word. When you know the word of God, you know the voice of God. Amen. And you know what he is saying. And Amen. watch this, Roscoe, you know what he ain't saying. Uh -huh. So when somebody looks you in the face and they got all the titles behind their name and they say God said it, and you know that ain't in the Bible, you can say with confidence God did not say that. Mm -hmm. Well, how are you going to say that? Who are you to tell me I'm apostle, I'm prophet, I'm this, I'm bishop? Yeah. Because it ain't in the Bible. You just made that up, you know, <laughs> and that's all it is and stuff. And so we thank God for the scriptures, and that's why we're walking through this book of Revelation, and we're being meticulous and tedious as we can. So let's go to Revelation 14. Let's look at Revelation 14. Go to verses 17 through 20. And like we said, guys, verses 17 through 20 are describing for us the final harvest of the earth that will take place at the return of Jesus Christ. Jesus, I'm sorry, John in Revelation 14 sees a total of three visions. And when we get to chapter 15, he's going to see one more vision. We have one more vision in the first, I think it's the first four verses of chapter 15. We'll see one more vision that John has. And then when we get to, I think, verse 5 in chapter 15, we will see this phrase, after this. You guys remember, what is that after this? That's that meta tower. That is a marker to let us know that this is a new series of things John is about to show. Mm -hmm. And so we have three visions in chapter 14, and then we have another vision at the beginning of chapter 15. And so in chapter 14, we have three visions there that deal with the end of the age. It deals with the end of the age. And what did we say? The end of the age is not the end of human history. The end of the age is the end of man's rule and government on the earth. Y'all follow that? It is a new age. We'll be going into a new age. When Christ returns, that will be the beginning of a new age. What is that new age? The new age of Christ, of the kingdom of Christ. Y'all follow that? So what John is seeing in Revelation 14 is the end of the age, the end of human history or the end of human rule, the rule of fallen man. Now, in verses 14 through 20, they detail for us one 
harvest event described to us in two distinctive harvestings, if you will. In other words, it's one event, but you're harvesting two things. You follow that? Now, anybody that's a farmer, you understand that language. It's one harvesting event, but there are going to be two distinct harvests. That's what we're looking at. And the reason why I'm describing it to you like that, because if you were to study out this on your own, a lot of people look at it as just, it's all just God harvesting the wicked or God harvesting the righteous. But no, there, the, there's the harvest of the righteous and the harvest of the wicked. And all of that takes place at the end of the age when Jesus returns. Very important. One group, we have the righteous who will listen to this be gathered into his barn and be brought into the earthly kingdom of Jesus Christ. What is that? What is that picture of? That's specifically uh, Revelation uh, 14, verses 14 through 16. So in verses 14 through 16, we have the harvesting of the righteous. Now remember, this isn't meant to be in chronological order. Okay? I don't want you to get the picture that the, har the righteous get harvest first and then now the wicked get harvest. And if we think like that, no, it's one big harvesting event. The harvest of the righteous and the harvest of the wicked, all of that will happen at the same time. It's not two, it's one big event with two distinct harvests that are being brought in. So in verses 14 through 16, we read about the first group. In verses 17 through 20, this is the second group that, are, that, that that's harvested. Or the second harvest, this is the harvest of the wicked who will be gathered out of his kingdom and thrown into the great wine press of the wrath of God and burned with unquenchable fire. That's verses 17 <laughs> through 20. Okay, so this is what's going to happen. Now, let's read Revelation 14, verses 14 through 20. Let's read it all. You listen, you follow along while I read it, okay? So verse 14, it says, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, Seated, seated on the cloud, one like the Son of Man, with a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, calling with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is fully ripe. So he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle across the earth, and the earth was reaped. That's the first group. That's the first group. That's the righteous. Remember, not chronologically, that's just the first, it's just describing the first harvesting. That's the righteous. They are harvested uh, out of the earth into the barn of Christ, which is a picture of the righteous being brought into what? The kingdom of Christ. Mm -hmm. Remember, Jesus is going to reign on the earth for a thousand years. This is the, the living righteous who will be alive when Christ returns. They will be gathered in, up in the earth and brought into his earthly kingdom where they will now live and reign with him and his kingdom for a thousand years. That's the picture that's being presented here. And then we go to verse 17. This is what we'll deal with today. Then another angel came out of the temple of heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. And what did it say? Uh, and another angel came out from the altar, the angel who has authority over the fire. He called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle, put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, for the grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trodden outside the city, and the blood flowed from the wine press as high as the horse's bridle for 1600 stadia. That's the harvest of the wicked. That's the harvest of the wicked. Now, let's deal with this. And I want to keep saying this because we live, we are so far removed from this ancient culture of how the Bible is written. We live in a democracy in this, in this thing. We, we're, we live where we have rights. But what we don't understand is that when we talk about when Christ returns, please understand this, guys. Christ isn't following the Bill of Rights. 
He's not following the tenets of communism or socialism. He's not building a democratic nation. There will be no voting rights. There will be no, we, we appreciate it. I love everything mom said about Black History Month. That's over. It ain't no white history, mom. All of that's gone. And see, we have to we have to brace our minds for this understanding that when Jesus returns, it will be what's known as a theocracy. Right, right, right. He will be king. Yes. And he will rule this earth with a rod of iron. Right. <laughs> Are you following what I'm saying? Yes. So 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 we're not talking about any rights. You you, you won't talk about cancel culture. When did Jesus come back? He's going to cancel the culture, all right. <laughs> Amen. And so we have to get an understanding of this. So what will happen when Jesus returns? Now look at this. Write down Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. Probably never read the book of Zechariah, but you need to. Zechariah is a good book. Good prophetic book. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4. I just want to read one verse. Write it down. It says, this is, we're asking, what will happen when Jesus returns? On that day... His feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west by, the, by a very wide valley. So that one half of the Mount shall move northward and the other half southward. Now what a scene there. What a scene. This should have been in the Avengers. I mean, this is, this is a scene. This verse describes the day that Jesus' feet touch down on the planet again. Wow. Mm. The moment Jesus' feet touch the planet, it says the mountain of Mount, Mount Olives in Jerusalem will be split in two. It will be level. Wow, what an interest. And we'll, when we get to the chapter 16, we'll see there's going to be a great earthquake. And so when we look at this, guys, this is describing that the city of Jerusalem will be leveled to the ground in an instant, in a massive expansion when Jesus returns. What happens once Jesus returns is immediately begins what's known as the judgment of the earth. When Jesus returns, he's not returning as a diplomat, an ambassador. He doesn't need to meet with any foreign states. He doesn't need to meet with any countries. He doesn't need to talk to anybody. When he returns, immediately, Dad, judgment begins. He divides the world. Now follow this, guys. Look at this. Matthew chapter 3, John the Baptist talks a little bit about this. Now watch this. Matthew chapter 3, verse 11 through 12. It says this. This is John the Baptist speaking about the coming of Christ. It says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. This is talking about Jesus. Now here's what we've got to recognize. When Jesus came in his first coming, did we see all of that take place? That's yes, right, Raymond. No. We didn't see all that. Okay, did, 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 did we see any of the chaff being burned with unquenchable fire? Did we see any of this massive judgment that would take place? We didn't see any of that take place. These are the words of John the Baptist. And watch this, guys. He's echoing words from the prophets. John the Baptist is not just saying something on his own accord. He is echoing the words of the Old Testament prophets. Listen to this. Now you've got to hear this. All right. The coming of the Messiah was always connected with two things. Salvation of his people, Israel, and destruction against his enemies. That's how it's always been connected. If you were to talk to a first century Jew... When you talked about the coming of the Messiah, here's what they believe, Kevin, that when the Messiah comes, he will save his people and he will destroy the nations. Right. Do y'all know that? 
Because remember, what do they ask Jesus when he's getting ready to return in Acts chapter 1? What does his own disciples ask? He says, now will you restore the kingdom? Right. What, are they, what are they really asking? Is, it, is, is are now you about to destroy all the Romans? Right. Right. You about to kill everybody now? Is, 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 does the killing begin now? Do, do we get ready to get rid of the Romans? Get rid of all the nations who put us down? Are we not? Are, are we about not to be? Are we about to be brought on high now? Because every Jew had that understanding. Well, now here's what Israel didn't see, and this is why we said when we asked you, did this happen when Jesus came in His first coming? Israel didn't see that there would be a pause. Right. Mm. They didn't see that. They didn't recognize that. They didn't recognize that it would be a gap of time between the Messiah's work of salvation and the Messiah's judgment of the nations. As a matter of fact, listen to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 through 4. It's important that you hear this. Even if you can't turn with me on this, write them down. Isaiah chapter 11. Let's let the word settle everything for us. Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1 through 4. It says, there shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse. And a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. Who is that talking about? David. Okay, in a picture, no, that's not talking about David. Mm -hmm. That's talking about Christ. Right. Mm -hmm. Christ. And it says, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Mm -hmm. The spirit of wisdom, understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Verse 3. And his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. Now watch this. He shall not judge by what he's, his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear. But with righteousness, he shall judge the poor and decide with equity the meek of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he shall kill the wicked. Right. Did that happen when Jesus first came? No, that did not happen in his first coming. We understand that, guys. But notice what the prophet says. That there's going to be a coming of the Messiah. He's going to judge the world. He's, he, uh, he's going to, the meek will inherit the earth. He's going to strike the, uh, the earth with the rod of his mouth. But it also says he's going to kill the wicked. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't do that in his first coming. He didn't do that. As a matter of fact, we know this verse when I start reading it. Isaiah 61. Listen to Isaiah 61 verses 1 through 2. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. Y'all remember that? Mm -hmm. When did Jesus say that? At the synagogue? Remember he goes to Nazareth? He goes to his own hometown? He opens up the Bible? And what is it? He reads this portion of scripture. Right. He says, the spirit of the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and opening of the prisons to those who are bound. And to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. But what's the last part of it in Isaiah? And the day of vengeance of our God. Jesus in Luke chapter 4 left the day of vengeance off. He read the entire scripture. And when it got to that part, he says to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And the scripture says in Luke 4, he closed the book gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. Now, any Jew would have recognized he didn't finish the rest of the verse. What was the rest of the verse? He was also there to proclaim the day of vengeance of our God. Like we said, guys, this is because in Jesus' first coming, he came bringing salvation, redemption, and forgiveness of sin, not vengeance. We are living in the day of forgiveness. Right, right. We are living in the day of grace. We are living in the day of redemption. We are living in the Messiah's first work. Right, right. We are still living in the reality of the first coming. Are y'all following that? Very important. But when the Lord returns in his second coming, he will become he will come bringing vengeance against his enemies in unbelievable wrath and judgment. That's the other part of it. Now turn. Go to Matthew 13. Matthew 13. We're answering the question. What will happen when Jesus returns? Because Christians, we gotta get out, we gotta get our hands out of the clouds. It, this isn't gonna be some Macy's parade. <laughs> this is not gonna be some coronation. Uh, all hail the queen and all this stuff that we see. Because see, when we think of somebody coming, we we got London on our brain. 
And that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about some coming that the world is going to be celebrating and they're going to have posters out and CNN and Fox and NBC and ABC. They're going to cover this all, man. Oh, we have the king coming back. No. This is not what's happening, guys. It is not. The day of the Lord, it, here's what Amos says. Who desires to see it? As Christians, we long for the return of Christ. But we long for the return of Christ, watch this, to avenge his people. And see, this is what we have to understand when we talk about what will happen when Jesus returns. Cars for everybody, no. <laughs> Healing for everybody, no. No. It's going to be massive judgment. Massive wrath. Massive death. This is the part that I think the church has been woefully ignorant. And us as pastors, we haven't taught you any of this. And people are just not prepared. And sinners who are still on the fence about Christ or have no clue what is getting ready to come on this planet. And look at what he says over in Matthew chapter 13. Look at verse 37. Matthew 13. You read this before. This is the parable of the wheat and the tear. And he answered... And says, here it is, here it is, guys. Watch this. Remember, he did the wheat and the tear. And what did the disciples come privately asking him? What does it mean? In other words, as you can imagine, Jesus does this parable of the wheat and the tear. And it's just like, you know, how everybody in church, y'all say, amen, amen. They don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and so privately, they get along with, okay, no, no. What, what you mean, Paul? Let me talk about just reading this tear. And Jesus explains it to them. Listen to it. Now you're going to see how God sees the world. Remember, Jesus is God in the flesh. Here's what he says. He answered and says, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. And the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy has sold, who sold them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. The reapers are the angels. I mean, Jesus just pretty much tells you exactly what the parable means. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers. And throw them into the fernery, fernery, a fiery furnace. He didn't say he's going to gather them out and throw them into another political party. Right. <coughs> he's going to gather them and throw them into the furnace. Mm -hmm. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has an ear, let him hear. This is how God sees the world. And it would behoove every Christian to start seeing the world like this. He does, God does not see the world broken down by political parties, by races, by different religious groups, by genders, by intellect, by class, by importance. He doesn't see it like that. God sees the world divided into two kingdoms. You have the sons of the kingdom right. and you have the sons of the devil. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's true. That's true. He doesn't care what your gender. Mm -hmm. He doesn't care what your class is. Right. He doesn't care if you're Elon Musk or you're the poorest person in Bangladesh. He doesn't care about your intellect. He doesn't care about, uh, uh, about your party system. Mm -hmm. How God sees the world, I got the sons of the kingdom and I got the sons of the devil. Right. And when Jesus returns, the sons of the devil will be gathered up in the earth and thrown into the fiery furnace. This is it. Well, who are the sons of the kingdom? The sons of the kingdom are all throughout the history of the earth, uh, uh, of mankind. You have those who look forward to the coming of the Messiah in obedience and faith. And you have those of us now 
who look back at the Messiah who has come in Jesus Christ in obedience and faith. You see, the ones who came before Christ, they were anticipating the Messiah living in obedience and in faith. Right, right, right. Those of us who now know who the Messiah is, we look back to the Messiah in obedience and faith. Same thing, guys, obedience and faith. Amen. Those are the sons of the kingdom. Well, somebody says, well, who's the sons of the devil? Everybody else. Everybody else. Everybody. Everybody else. Everybody else is the son of the devil. So you're telling me everybody else who ain't in the sons of the kingdom going to be gathered out when Jesus turned and thrown into hell? Yes. That is exactly what I'm saying. No sinner will be allowed to go into the kingdom. A time is coming when everyone who causes sin and everyone who breaks the law, God's law, will be gathered up and thrown into the fire. A time is coming. There's going to be a generation that's going to be alive on the planet. When, when that happens, they will be all gathered up and thrown to hell. This is the future of the world. At the end of the age, the sons of the devil, listen to this, that are alive during that time. Somebody say, whoa, well, if I die before that, I ain't got to worry. No, because you go to hell earlier if you die. <laughs> see, 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 you you going to get thrown in at your death. <laughs> you get it? But what this verse is saying, everyone that's alive at that time, during that time, and see, if you think about it, well, that's kind of unfair. Why is all the wrath coming on them? Well, ask that to Israel who was alive when Jesus came. Right. Do you know it was a specific generation that was alive that saw God walk there? Right. What about the other people who didn't get a chance to see? Mm -hmm. right. Right. Uh, oh, how about this? What did Jesus say? He said to Beth Bethsaida, right. Chorazim, and Capernaum. He says, man... Judgment's going to be worse for y'all than it was for Sodom and Gomorrah and Tyre and Sidon. Right, right. Well, why ain't got to be worse for this, that generation? Right. Mm -hmm. Jesus told that generation that was alive, he said, all the blood of the prophets that y'all slain right. from the beginning all the way to Zechariah are going to fall on y'all. Right. So see, don't come with me with the thing of saying, well, that's not fair. Why it's got to be that generation? Jesus, think about those who, who were alive during that time. So those sinners that are alive during the tribulation, all of God's wrath will be poured out in fury on that generation of sinners. I want that to settle in. All who have not bowed a knee to Christ. All who do not know Jesus. All who are riding the fence. All who are in other religions. During this time, all the judgment and wrath of God will fall on that generation of sinners. And if they are alive at the time when Christ returns, they will be gathered up and they will be thrown into hell. This is for loved ones who don't know Christ. This is for grandmamas, mamas, sons, daughters, fathers. This is for all of them. This is what awaits this planet. Here's the deal. We're closer to that time than ever before. The way y'all keep saying it, we'll be closer than we were yesterday. Amen. True. That's right. Do you get it, guys? I'm asking the question, what will happen when Jesus returns? Pick next. No. No. And if you read verse 17 through 20, what we read in Revelation, you're going to get a taste of it. Because here's what it says, guys. When Jesus, what this means is that when Jesus returns, every single wicked person that has not bowed the knee in obedience and faith to the Lord Jesus Christ that is alive at that time will be slaughtered before the Lord. And I think this is the point that most believers don't understand. We don't understand it. We don't understand it. We go back to Matthew 13 where Jesus says, the Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all Causes of sin in all lawbreakers. Mm. Wow. 
And today, when we look at Revelation 14, verses 17 through 20, we're looking at that harvest. Mm -hmm. Go back to Revelation 14. Look at verse 17. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Man, it, 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 it. Imagine if you were living during the time of Noah. What did Jesus say? They were eating and drinking, mm -hmm. giving into marriage, and then he says, and the day that Noah entered the ark, the flood came and swept them all away. <laughs> oh, God. He says, what about the days of Lot? He said they were building, living, marrying, drinking. And as soon as Lot left out of Sodom, right. God rained down fire and destroyed them all. Guys, the world will have no clue. And the worst thing that can happen if Christians are sitting up here having no clue either. Sure. Mm -hmm. And we're thinking that everything is going to be picnics and cookies and cakes and all this stuff, man. And bless, you still got these people who stand up behind these pulpits just raining down lies mm -hmm. on people every day. Mm -hmm. And they're not preparing people for what's happening and what's Amen. coming. That's right. That's true. That's right. Amen. Look at Revelation 14, 17. You will not be in this church and not know what's coming. Amen. 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 Look at this. Verse 17. Then another angel came out of the temple of heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. The word then, then it connects the vision of this harvest to the previous one. Important that you understand this. This harvest is not some new harvest. It is connected to the other one. It's connected to the other one. Okay, who's the one who did the reaping? Remember, Jesus took his sickle and swung it across the earth, and the Bible said, and the earth was reaped. So in that portion of him reaping, all of it now is telling you, in one instance you have the righteous who are gathered into the born, and now, what about all the wicked? This is what we're about to read about. But so now it says that the understanding is that, again, this is two harvesting events. It's, it, 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 I'm sorry, it's not two harvesting events. It's just two distinct ways in describing one harvest. And notice it says the angel came out of the temple in heaven. Why did the angel come out of the temple in heaven? What does that mean? This means that the harvest is initiated by God. Remember, guys, I want to help you. When we're reading this language that the angel came out of the temple of heaven, don't get a picture that God is up in heaven living in a temple. Right. <laughs> He's omnipresence. Right. Here's what Solomon said. The heavens cannot contain you, mm -hmm. let alone this temple that I have built to you. When it talks about the temple, it is as if God is using baby talk to, to, so we can understand. That's what John Calvin calls it. It's like God uses baby talk so we can understand it. Literally, no, it's, it's not some big old, oh, look at that big old temple. That's like the fool's thinking that this mansions all in heaven. You say, no, that, those words are so we can understand. When the angel comes out of the temple, it's literally saying this angel comes out of the presence of God. He comes up letting us know that this harvest is initiated by God. It's initiated by God. The angel comes out of the immediate presence of God. Means that he has been commissioned by the Lord. The final harvesting of the earth is according to God's redemptive plan. The harvesting of the earth is all a part of God's great big redemptive plan. Mm. Now what? Okay guys, we're living in the parts of what? His restoration, his redemption, his salvation, his forgiven. That's what we're living in. Amen. But when this happens, this is the other part of God's redemptive plan. Notice it says here, the angel had, he too had a sharp sickle. He too had one. What this means is that he has been given authority to harvest the wicked in service of the Lord. Remember that? What did we read about in Matthew 13? Y'all still with me? What did Jesus say? The Son of Man will send out what? His angels. It says the Son of Man will send out his angels. That's Jesus. It says in Matthew 13, the angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous. 
and throw them into the fiery furnace. And in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Notice that the Lord sends or commissions his angels to reap the earth on his behalf. Okay? That's what's happening here. If you go read Matthew chapter 24, write down Matthew tw chapter 24. Look at verse 30 through 31. Matthew 24, verse 30 through 31. It says, Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, they that will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Look at verse 31. <clears throat> and he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds and from one end of heaven to the other. Notice that angels, mom, are used in the harvesting of the earth. Mm -hmm. Just like Jimmy, they harvest up the wicked, they harvest up the righteous. Y'all following the picture there? Yeah. So these angels are not just out there just doing something. It's not a picture of just angels just doing whatever they want to you know. They're working and understand and, 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 uh, and on behalf of the Lord. What this means is that the return of Jesus, another way of saying it, is one big massive harvesting event. Okay? One big massive harvesting event. Now you want to make sure you're on the right side of the harvest. Amen. I'm going to keep stressing this. Okay. One way or the other, you're going to get harvested. All right. You want to make sure you're on the right side of the harvest. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you do that? How do you make sure? Follow the need of Christ. Repent. Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Continually ask the Holy Spirit to, 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 to work his regenerating, sanctifying power in you. That's what you do. You Thank God we're not there yet. <laughs> Look at verse 18. And another angel came out from the altar, the angel who had authority over the fire. Oh, look at that right there. This is now the sixth angel. <clears throat> Remember, I told you there are a total of seven angels. This is the sixth one. Now, unlike the other five angels who we're just told that this is another angel, what do we notice about this one? Let's get a little bit more detail. This is the angel, what does it say there, guys, who had authority over the fire. Now listen to this. The King James says he has power over fire. Now that's not a good translation because the King James leaves out the definite article. Anybody know what a definite article is? The. 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 If you go look this up in the Greek, it actually has the definite article. So what it's saying is this is not the angel over fire. This is the angel over the fire. The fire. So that's going to make me say what? What fire? Mm -hmm. Y'all get that right? Yeah. A definite article means something. Right. Okay, if I say, man, uh, go to a bridge. Well, that could be any bridge. If I say go to the bridge, I'm talking about a specific bridge. That's why the definite article is important. So this is, a, this is some fire angel. This isn't a human torch. This isn't, this, isn't, this isn't some fire angel. No, this is an angel that has specific authority over the fire. Well, we could, if you kind of put the verse together, it's talking about he came from the altar. It's the fire from the altar. Now watch this. This is important. This is very important because that definite article is important. This angel is not in charge of fire in the sense of all fire. He has authority over the fire of the altar. The word authority in the Greek means to hear. It means to preside over. Or to control over. What this means is that this specific angel presides over the fire that comes from the altar. The fire that comes from the altar. Now watch this. We already know what this is talking about. Go back to Revelation 6. Go back to Revelation 6. I, I'm not going to lie. It, it, Bible interpretation can be hard only because... We are so far removed from that culture. So when we hear that this is the angel that's over the fire from the altar, what comes in our mind is an altar. So what we think about is we see some big massive altar in heaven. And chances are, if we grew up in like a Methodist church, we think of a Methodist altar. You know, a little altar that was up here, you know, you bend down with the little cushion uh, things for your knees. Yeah. You know, uh, that's the kind of concept we have. This is this is just natural. And me, 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 me and Lindsay were talking about this. 
Think about all the words we have in our culture today. What's going to happen five year, hundred years from now when people are reading our stuff? Think about what in the world were they talking about? What do they mean by that? That's why it can be so difficult. So when we see this, we're thinking of an altar. And I don't want you to get you. A, I don't want you to get a picture. This, this, it's not like an altar. There's nobody kneeling down before God in heaven on the bench or something like that. No. Revelation chapter six verse nine says this. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Now watch this, guys. These souls are the millions of believers who have been mercilessly slaughtered by the kingdom of the beast. So notice that they were under the altar and they were praying to God. Now here's the deal. If you understand the tabernacle furniture from the Old Testament, we understand what the golden altar was. Remember the furniture? You had an altar called the brazen altar. It sat on the outer course. Sean, with the brazen altar, that's where they took the sacrifice, the bullock, the ram. Uh, they, would, they would sacrifice it on that altar. Then, after that, you would have that altar there, and then it was a big basin called the brazen laver. This is where the priests would go and wash. Well, now, why would they wash? Because of the blood. Okay. Guys, Peter would go crazy in the ancient times. I want you to get a picture of the temple. It was a bloody mess. They would slit the throats of the animals. They would kill. They would drain the blood. And literally, go read the book of Leviticus. It said Moses would take a basin of the blood and throw it on the side of the altar. It was also verses where Moses would take the blood of, of, of the calf and he would sprinkle it on the people. Right. Y'all ain't ready. That. Can you imagine me stand up here? With some blood, and I say, Y'all come over here, and I just start throwing. <laughs> come. This is what we're talking about. They would take a basin of blood and just throw it on the altar. <laughs> they would, they would, and then, and then God would say, Drain the entrails, take out the kidney, remove the liver, move this up. It was a bloody scene. It was, they were butchers. Literally, they would have to take the hind quarters. They would have to leave. Sometimes God would say, okay, now the breast, that's for the pre uh, priest. So you would cut the breast off, leave that in the portion of the priest. Then, but you had to make sure you remove the kidneys, remove the entrails, remove the long lobe of the liver. They were talking. And you were like, what in the world? Mm -hmm. Because the scene there was, it was a bloody mess. I'm saying this for a reason. It's going to help us when we get to this, this verse. Mm -hmm. And so now, when we think about this altar... When you, after they would wash, they would then go into the holy place. In the holy place, what would they see? They would see a menorah. It would be a seven-branch candlestick. You would see a table of shoe bread with ten loaves of bread there. Not cologne. I don't think they like this little slice bread. These are like little wafers, little crackers. And then right before the holy of holies, there would be a golden altar. Amen. And what they were told to do is to go and take fire from the brazen altar. Bring it to the golden altar, place it, bring, put it there, and it would offer incense up to God that would go up to his nostrils. Now, at the time, they would do this twice a day. The people would be outside praying. And as they would pray, they would see the smoke going up, knowing that their prayers were ascending to God. So, what is the true golden altar? It's a picture of the prayers of the saints. Did, did it make sense here? It's not a picture of someone. Okay, when you, you, you go to heaven, do not Aaron go in the sky for the altar. I want to see the gold altar. It's not all gold altar. It's, it's no, that's not what we're talking about. All the altar truly represents is the prayers of the saints. Amen. But, but God gave us a picture in the Old Testament so we could see our prayers going up. Y'all follow that? 
That's the picture there. And so now what we read in Revelation chapter 6 is what's going on at this altar? All the saints who have been beheaded and killed during the tribulation, they are praying prayers saying what? The whole prayer how long until you avenge our deaths? That's the prayer that's being prayed. So guys, what are we saying, guys? The true altar of incense is not a piece of heavenly furniture. It is literal, the real prayers and supplications of the saints before the presence of God. Every time you pray, you are participating in the golden altar of incense. Amen. Every time. Amen. Every time. Amen. Every time. Every time you pray. That's why prayer is important. Because every time we pray, we are in, and they did it twice a day. And I'm not telling you you have to pray twice a day, but that was the picture there of what it was. In Revelation 6, in the breaking of the fifth seal, all we see are these pray, saints praying for God to avenge in, in their blood. And look at what happened in Revelation chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8. Here's another scene of the altar. In Revelation chapter 8, here's another scene of it. Are you there? It says here, and another angel came and stood, verse 3, and another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and, 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 sorry, with a golden censer, and was given much incense to offer with the prayers of the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and threw it on the earth, there were peals of thunder, rumbling, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. That's in chapter 8. If, you, if you've been with us for that time, what happens after the angel does that? The seven trumpets begin. Seven trumpets. So watch this. The answer to the prayers of the tribulation saints is the wrath of God. How does God answer those prayers of vengeance? He, he, he brings wrath. And so what we read in Revelation 14, 18 is God finally answering those prayers in full. This is why this angel who is over the fire of the altar comes out and tells the angel with the sickle, go ahead and read. Because now this angel is saying it's time to avenge the saints. Y'all get that? Yes, sir. That's literally what's going on there. Wow. Remember the story we read in Luke chapter 18 about the, uh, the, the woman who kept coming to the judge? Y'all yeah. remember that? We went over that last week? Yes, sir. I want to read that last part here. Uh, in, in Luke 18, verse 6, it says, And the Lord said to her, Hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? <laughs> Guys, why is there so much judgment going on on the earth in the tribulation period? Because it is God avenging his people. Man. And I know we don't understand that. But that's what it is. And when we look at it, go back to Revelation 14, verse 18. Revelation 14, 18. And he called with a loud voice to the one who had the sharp sickle. This is the angel who came out from the fire at the altar. Put in your sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth. The angel in charge of the prayers of the tribulation saints is the one calling out to the angel with the sharp sickle to harvest the wicked. In essence, God, at the end of the great tribulation, will finally judge and avenge the blood of his people. That's what's going on, guys. This is the avenging of God. Now watch this. Turn to 2 Thessalonians. Put a screen back in Revelation 14, because I just want you to see this. Because here, here's a topic that we don't talk about. Mm -hmm. Vengeance. Right. I ain't talking about your vengeance, because see, you... We can't venge anything. That's why I remember it says, Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Do you understand that part of the reason why Christ comes back is to avenge his people? Amen. <laughs> that 
vengeance. And look at what it says in 2 Thessalonians. Listen to these words. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. Mm -hmm. Verse 5. <coughs> Excuse me. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God, that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you. How does God repay those who afflict you? With affliction. And to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us. When? When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They will suffer eternal punishment Sorry, destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. Do you understand that when Christ returns, the massive amount of it is to avenge his name? Amen. Think about what's going on in the world today. Do you understand that? What's going on in the world? Do you see some of the laws that are being enacted? Mm -hmm. Are you listening to some of the debates that are going on amongst the world? And the new? It, it is almost a, a mockery. Amen. Christianity is now a mockery. God is coming back to avenge his name. And that and when you think about that, I want you to get that picture of how when Jesus returns, yes, it is to bring his saints into his kingdom, but it's to avenge his name. And that vengeance, Lindsay, will fall on the heads of that generation of sinners that's alive at that time. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe it's not going to be that bad. Keep reading. <laughs> Look at Revelation. Go back to 14. Mm -hmm. Revelation 14. Because see, I know you think that when you get married, you can repay somebody back. Your little cuss out don't mean nothing. <laughs> your, your little ignoring somebody. Your, uh, you, know, your, your, you know, how we do it when we get mad. I ain't speaking to them. You know, I'm going to get them back. That is not how God does. Oh, y'all ain't prepared for how God's vengeance will be unleashed on this planet. And I think if we got a good picture of that, it would compel us as believers. And I said that, 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 that sometimes we have to just continue to pray for people who don't know Christ. Pray for people. We got to keep them in our prayers day and night, day and night, day and night, day and night, day and night. Then God save them. God save them. God save them. God save them at the last hour. Whatever. Because, guys, we know, the Bible says, therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. It didn't say, therefore, Jimmy, knowing the blessings of the Lord, we persuade men. No, no, we persuade men knowing the terror that's coming on the land. Look at what it says in 14, look at verse 18, the sea clause. He says, thrust in your sickle, why? Because the grapes are ripe. The phrase, the grapes are ripe, are only, this, this is only used in Revelation. It means that the grapes have reached maturity. They are at their prime. This means that the sinners living during the great tribulation will be so vile, so evil, so wicked, that they will be ripe for judgment and destruction. Right. Hmm. Sin will have run its full course within the government of man, reaching its apex to the point that the grapes are now bursting with juice. Put your hand if you like grapes. Well, I mean, have you ever got a good grape? I'm not a good grape. When you bite into it, what, what comes out of it? That juice comes out. Now, I want you, I want you to get the image here. These grapes are so ripe, Elder Charles, they're bursting with juice. Literally, 
They're ready to be stomped out right. so we can get that juice out. God is saying that the sinners at that time are going to be so oh ripe God. that they are ready to be stomped out. Mm. And we're going to get their juice out. Mm. But what juice are we talking about? Blood. Are you getting the image? Are you getting the image? Get, get your mind on grape juice now. Right. The image there is meant to show you. Watch this. Look, write down Joel chapter 3 verse 13. You say, is this really biblical? Joel chapter 13, I'm sorry, chapter 3 verse 13. It says, put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the wine press is full. The vats overflow, for their evil is great. The Bible talks about in Romans chapter 2 that you're just storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath. God is so patient, so long-suffering that every law that is put, every, every, every wickedness that is going on, it is just being stored up to the point that that generation that's alive, the Jews, they're going to be so ripe, so thick, so plump, that they're going to be ready to be crushed. And literally, guys, look at what it says in Revelation 14, 19. So the angel swung his sickle across the earth and gathered the grape harvest of the earth and threw it in the great wine press of the wrath of God. What this verse is saying is that all sinners will be gathered and thrown into the great wine press of the wrath of God. Now watch this. In ancient Israel, you had a, a wine press was a common thing that people used to make wine. Remember we talked about that. Y'all, please hear this. you got to get this imagery. A wine press was a large carved out piece of stone in the shape of a vat. In other words, it would be a large stone that would, they would carve out with a vat that they would go and literally, watch this, they would take hundreds of thousands of grapes that had been freshly harvested from the vineyard. So you would gather those grapes and you would pour them out into this vat, Lindsay. So that's what the picture there is. Now watch this. Below the vat, they would carve out a trough to where when you stomped on the grapes, it would be, it would take the juice of the grapes and it would break it down in this trough to gather it in this like little barrel area. That was the picture there. Now watch. The juice from the grapes came from men and women. Both men and women would get into the vat and with, with all the grapes there, and they would stomp on the grapes. They would just walk around and just stomp on the grapes. They would just stomp on them. They would just continue to stomp, and they would stomp in order to squeeze the juice out of the grapes. Watch this. The one who stomped on the grapes were called the one who trampled the wine press. Because guess what they would do? They would trample the wine press. And here's the picture. Are you ready? They would be covered with the splattering grape juice all on them, and it would be running down like a river into this trough area that would collect the juice. That's the picture. Amen. Gather the grape harvest of the earth and throw it into the great wine press of the Lord. What Revelation 14, 19 is saying that instead of it being grapes that will be crushed and trampled on and the juice from the grapes flow out, it will be the life of sinners who will be crushed and it will be their life blood that will flow out like a river. That's horrifying. See, you don't get it. Now, if they would put that in salt, hmm, some scary movie. Let's say you have a scary movie and you put about 10 humans. No, you put up 100 humans. And in that, you get one of the things that they use to, you ever seen those things that, that, that they use to press metal down when they heat up the metal and they press it, and you just start just dropping it on. And you just see it, and it's just crushing these people and their blood and juices just running out. That's the image that John sees of what will happen when Jesus returns. 
the wine press of God's wrath begins with the dumping of the seven bold judgments. And then it ends with the slaughtering of the whole kingdom of the Antichrist when Jesus returns. Literally, guys, the return of Jesus on the earth will literally be a bloodbath. And I don't think Christians understand. I can look at your faces now. You, you, we get it when we see it in movies. Rambo. Some other movie. But we just cannot fathom that this is going to happen. But why would God give John this image? And it is so vivid. It is so detailed. In verse 20, 14, 20, he says, And the wine press was trodden outside the city, and the blood flowed from the wine press as high as the horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. Again, are we talking about grapes? No. We're talking about human beings. Amen. Let's make it personal. Do you know anybody who does not know Christ? If they are alive at this time, they will be in that wine press and they will be stomped out. And instead of it being me and Lindsay walking into the nice little vat for the grape juice, it will be Jesus getting into the wine press and stomping out the lives of all sinners. Prior to his establishment of his kingdom. I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. It literally says the blood of sinners will flow from the horse's bridle. That's four feet for 100, 180 to 200 miles. Now, let watch this, guys. When you look up that number, this is the entire length of Palestine, the entire length of Israel from east to west. The entire length. Somebody says, I don't believe this. Well, then go to Isaiah 63. Amen. Go to Isaiah 63. Because see, what did I tell you? The reason what gets us with Revelation, we don't know the Old Testament. Is John just saying something? No, he's echoing the prophets. It's already been prophesied. Isaiah was 700 years before the birth of Christ. This was already prophesied. In Isaiah 63, Look at verse 1. This is talking about Jesus. you got to see what this imagery is saying here. Everybody turn to Isaiah 63. Now put the string in Revelation 14. We're going to come back. But I want you to see this with your own eyes in Isaiah 63 verse 1. We're going to read verse 1 through 6. It says, Who is this who comes from Edom? In crimson garments from Bozrah. He who is splendid in his apparel. Marching in the greatness of his strength. It is I speaking in righteousness. Mighty to save. Listen to this. Look at verse 3. Why is your apparel red? And your garments like his who treads in the wine press. Listen to the answer. I have trodden the wine press alone. And from the peoples no one was with me. I tried them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath, and their life blood splattered on my garments and stained all my apparel. For the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption had come. Verse 5. I looked, but there was no one to help, and I was appalled, but there was no one to uphold. So in my own arm brought me salvation, and my wrath upheld me. Look at verse 6. I trampled down the people in my anger and made them drunk in my wrath. I poured out their lifeblood on the earth. Mm. Ooh, Jesus. That's Jesus. Mm. <laughs> that is Jesus. Mm. Mm. What a vivid and graphic detail of the return of the Messiah. Watch this. In his first coming, our Lord... He came and poured out his own blood on the earth. In his second coming, he's going to pour out the blood of sinners on the earth. Here's what amazes me. 
every single coming of Christ, right. blood is always associated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In his first coming, mm -hmm. it was about his blood. Right. In his second coming, it's going to be about your blood or my blood for those who don't know Christ. Mm -hmm. But either way it goes, it's going to be, it was a bloody scene when he first came, right. it's going to be a bloody scene when he comes again. That's right. Amen. This ain't the Christianity I know because you never knew it. Right. It wasn't right. Christianity. It was pipe dreaming. It was lies. This is what the Bible says yeah. when Jesus returns. And there are those of us who know people who have this fate waiting for them. And they think it's a joke. You have Christians right. who are joking with their salvation. Amen. You have those of us, all of us, who are still wrestling with sins. Come on, man. Right. And we think we're playing. We think we're kitty catting and God going hee hee and jaw jaw. No, this, this isn't that. When Jesus comes, he says, I trampled them in my anger. Yeah. Nobody was there to help me. Mm. <sighs> Guys, look at Revelation 19. I just want you to see it. Revelation 19, verse 11. What an image. What an image. And I picture this because that's, that's why I talked about the thing with the priests. Imagine what the priests look like. Imagine what the priests look like after a day's work. Imagine I was a priest at the temple and I came home and I, hey, Lance, how you doing? You look like a bloody mess. Because what you've been slaughtering animals, mm. sin offerings. But now, it'll be Jesus who is the one that is covered in the blood of those who didn't want him to reign anyway. Look at what it says in Revelation 19, verse 11. Let's get a picture of when Christ touched down. We're getting there. Somebody's like, when are we going to ever get to Revelation? We're going to get there. <laughs> look, at, look at chapter 19. Let me give you a preview. Verse 11. Then I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes are like a flame of fire. And on his head are many diadems. And he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He, he is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen white and pure, were following him on white horses. Mm. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which he will strike down the nations and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh was a name written King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Mm. Jesus comes and he alone treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. It is Jesus, say Jesus, Jesus. who crushes out the life of his enemies. And this is, I guarantee, is not the Jesus that most people know. We know the blonde hair, blue eyed Jesus. The one who sits there in the pictures with his hands all weird looking with the poses. That's somebody's son. I mean, we know this movie Jesus. All right. Hollywood Jesus. The Jesus that wouldn't hurt a fly. We probably have pictures of Jesus making sure he's jumping over cockroaches that he didn't want to step on nothing. He wouldn't swat anything. But look at the picture of when he comes back. Have you bowed the knee? Jesus. Have you bowed the knee? Mm. Are you thanking God for the time of grace that we have now? Amen. Come yes. on. The That's redemption right. that we have now? Yes. Yes. Amen. Are you so appreciative mm. that God has bestowed redemption yes. upon you yes. that you don't have to be a partaker of his wrath? Come on now. Are, are you still needing another blessing? Mm. You need another car. You need him to do something to your sick body. Come on. Mm. No. I need him to spare me from that. All right. That's what I need. All and that's right. exactly what he's done Amen. in his first coming. Right. Yeah. Mm. That's
That is exactly what he's done. You said, well, this just sounds like a guy who don't love anybody. What do you think he came for the first time to do? Right. To spare you from that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him yes. shall not perish. Amen. God doesn't want you to perish. God don't want you to be in the vat. He don't want to stomp your life out, but he will. All right. For those who reject him, for those who have no affinity to Christ, who have nothing to do with him, guys, this is what awaits our planet. This is what's awaiting the world. And let me close with that last part. And the blood flow from the wine press as high as the horse's bridle for 1600 stadium. This is a visual to uh, a, a, a description of how much blood will be poured out. Now let me give you this. The average human adult has about 10 pints or roughly 5 quarts. It could be 6 quarts of blood. Right. So when you do the math, and somebody has actually done the math, this would actually take about 83.9 trillion people to produce this amount of blood. So we know it's not meant to be necessarily taken literally because there are not 89.3 trillion people on the planet. Right. So when you go study this phrase out, John Gill, who was an 18th century theologian, in his commentary on Revelation, he says that this was a Jewish expression to express a great slaughter. Right, right. In other words, during the Jewish rebellion, Josephus writes about the slaughter of Bithar. And listen to what he says. He says, they went on slain until a horse was plunged in blood up to his nostrils and blood ran four miles into the sea. So Jews would use sayings like this. You know, actually in Ezekiel chapter 32 verse 6, listen to what Ezekiel writes in chapter 32 verse 6. He talks about this when Jesus returns. I will drench the land even to the mountains with your flowing blood and from the ravines will, uh, uh, will be full of you. In other words, I will drench the land up to the mountains with your flowing blood. Mm -hmm. Is that meant to be literal? No. So if you kill all the people in the land, are their bloods going to reach up to the mountains? No. No, it's a, you get it. It's an expression of a great slaughter. That's the picture there, guys. It's the equivalent to us saying, "Man, that crime scene looked like a bloodbath." Right, right, right. Okay, are you saying it was so much blood that you can actually fill it up in a tub and bathe in it? No, it wasn't that much blood. I mean, no. Are you saying I'm knee deep in bills? So if I came to your house, are your knee, uh, your bills are all the way up to my knees? No. So what that means, I walk in your door, your knees, your bills are all up to my knees. No, we, we use it as an expression, say I'm so much in debt, man. I, I, I can't. I'm up in my eyeballs. You see, it's an expression like that. Remember I told you when we're studying the Bible, we have to understand in their culture, they had expressions just like we had expressions. Right. And that's what this is meant to do. This is a picture of a slaughter that is unfathomable. And this proves it. Watch this, guys. This is the terrifying future of all sinners, all rejectors, and all enemies of God. Go back to Revelation 19. Let's look at it. Revelation 19. Remember, when Jesus returns. In Revelation 19, look at verse 17. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead. This is the way he said to the birds, Come, gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, the flesh of their riders, the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. Notice what happens when Christ returns. There is a call sent out to all the birds. Come, for the Lord has provided a great supper. But what's the supper? Some bird feet? They went to PetSmart? No. Did you just read what the sub? He says, come and gorge. gorge. <laughs> Man, that's a word for you, Sean. Stuff. Gorge. Stuff yourself. <laughs> Stuff yourself. <laughs> Silly. I mean, birds can't even walk. They're so full. <laughs> Billy just pot bit it out. He says, come and gorge yourself on the flesh of kings. Mm. Slave, rich, poor. Mm. Oh, my God. This is the picture there. 
And I saw the beasts and the kings of the earth and the armies uh, gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured with, 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 and with it the false prophet who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. That's Revelation 19. That's how the millennial kingdom began. With the supper for the birds. I don't know about you guys, the writer in Hebrews said it best. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Mm. And look at what it says there. Listen to this. Everybody listen to me. Listen to this. Everybody listen. Everybody listen. I'm about the kids. Listen, 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 listen to what it says in Hebrews 2. This is for all of us. For if we go on sinning deliberately, mm. after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice of sin. So what remains? but a fearful expectation of judgment and a, and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Anyone who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, and has outraged the Spirit of grace? If you lived under the Old Testament, if you violated the law, you died without mercy. The writer of Hebrews says, how much worse do you think for those who trample the Son of God, who despise the word of grace? How much worse do you think it's going to be? And then he goes on to say, For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Mm -hmm. Revelation 14 is just a picture of the end. And that great harvest. And right now, we are alive now that we can decide on which harvest we want to be in. Amen. 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 Isn't that something? We can decide. God, God has given us his grace now. We don't have to be a part of that picture. And for those of us who know that we're on the right side of the harvest, what about those who are on the wrong side? I'm not saying you got to just go and drop people over the head all the time, but I didn't get prayers. I know God was dealing with me. Are you committed to praying for those people? Or you just got sick of it? Don't get sick of it. Every day. Every day you pray, Lord, save them. If you call them by name. If the opportunity arises to talk to people, talk. Open your mouth. Be bold. Pray for a spirit of boldness. Because, guys, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen. And then we, we still got to read Revelation 15. That's what we're going into next week. That's the prelude to the seven bowls. Then we got to get through the seven bowls. <laughs> That's 16. Then we got to hear about the destruction of the economy and the, and the whole system of the world in chapters 18. And then finally in 19, we get to the return of Christ, but I already showed you what's going to happen when he returns. Guys, the time is short. The time, I don't know what generation will be alive. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know. Christ can come back tomorrow. Uh, it, it, the rapture can happen tomorrow. Uh, uh, things can end up flowing like this quickly. Oh, guys, we can have another 100 years. I don't know. I don't know about you guys, I can't see another hundred years with the way things are going. With some of the laws that are being put into place by these ridiculous people who we call politicians, it's unbelievable. Our politicians have lost their freaking mind. <laughs> they have lost their minds with some of these laws. And, and, and you have, some of you are not even reading them. This, this LGBT thing that they pass in the Congress is absolutely horrific. It will be the end of churches no longer being able to say, we don't, we withhold services from those who are gay because it goes against our religious freedom. No longer with that. Mm. 
adoption agencies will no longer be who are Christians will have to be able to now if two men want to come and say oh, I'm going to adopt the baby well no I'm a Christian we don't do that they can be sued if this passes the Senate but this is because of the idiots we've all voted in <laughs> and it doesn't just start with Joe Biden it started with Trump it started with Obama Clinton. it started with Clinton yeah. Amen. and this is where we are and I hope every Christian is proud of who's in the White House. Amen. Amen. Because it's ridiculous of what's going on in Washington right now. Amen. And it was ridiculous under Trump, and it's ridiculous now. And it's just going to get even worse. Amen. 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 So I don't think we got 100 years. I don't think we got it. Because if we let these politicians have it, won't be a planet. Oh, my Lord. Mm. Because that's where we are in this society. Mm. And get your heart out of this world system, guys. This is where the world is going. Talk to people about Christ. Pray for your family members. Pray for your friends, guys, because this is where things are going. I don't think we have long. Amen? Amen. 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 Stand to your feet. Oh, Jesus. <coughs> Amen. Amen. The Bible says righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach amongst, amongst any people. Guys, we are there. This world has gone absolutely bananas. But all these things that are going on with the, 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 the gender things, I was talking to my daughter, Jordan, and we, you know, we all be having these conversations and we're living in a world where I can't call a man a man. That's now discrimination. I see you as a woman. You have, a, you look like a woman, you sound like a woman, and you tell me you're a man. <laughs> and you have politicians saying that we got to get into reality. I thought I was. No, reality, guys, is now evil. And this is where we are. I, 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 and it's going to get worse. Murder is on the rampage. Abortion is at an all-time high. The land, how much blood is being filled in this land with, with babies? Oh, no, I'm sorry, fetuses, embryos. No. How many churches are still closed? Mm -hmm. how, how, how many scandals do we have amongst ministers? What, what, what is it all in? And I think we're, when we read the book of Revelation, we see it. Guys, we got to make sure that we are serious about our walk with Christ. We got to make sure that we're serious about praying for those who don't know him. Because we do not have long. We just don't have long. Amen? Amen. Amen. Close out the broadcast. Thank you guys for joining with us, joining with us on Wednesday. Don't forget to cash out us up on our Facebook page and our YouTube page as well. We'll see you on Wednesday. Guys.